Hello, this is Pastor Patrick Hines, and welcome to another Brittle Heights Presbyterian Church pulpit supplemental. And uh, today, I'm going to read um, a couple sections from a book and make a bunch of comments along the way. Um, it's always an encouraging thing uh, to discover uh, a new author that you're not familiar with. Um, and you know, I'd heard of Herman Witsius, and I um, I had uh, uh, read sections of his book, Economy of the Covenants. Um, I... I uh, I think it's digitally out there somewhere uh, on something that I have, but I've read something. I read some stuff by by him, but never actually owned any like hard copies of his books. Well, um, Reformation Heritage uh, has published uh, Economy of the Covenants. When I read, I put sticky tabs in uh, books and write in them. This is uh, just volume one of Economy of the Covenants between God and Man by Herman Witsius, which I've always heard is a great book. But uh, Joel Beakey uh, wrote a lengthy introduction uh, to this book. I'm, I think I'm pretty sure it was Beakey that wrote it. Uh, volume 2 is on the bookshelf back there, but started plowing into this, and I also got it digitally on Kindle because it's so good that I want to be able to type notes uh, to it because there's a lot of things I want to remember. And one of the cool things about using the Kindle app um, is you can pull up your notations and your highlights and your underlining uh, on any gadget, like on your phone, Kindle. I have a Kindle HD 10 over here. I've got my computer at home, my computer here. Uh, my laptop, I can look at stuff on Kindle, and it keeps my notes uh, no matter where I pull it up on my account. So that's really, really cool. One of the books, however, that Beaky mentioned that was written by Herman Witsius, and this is probably just one of those examples of how the Puritans uh, and these, these guys that were great theologians of, of long ago, after the Reformation, like the second, third generation um, uh, Puritan reformer guys, they were not good at coming up with catchy book titles. Okay, so here's, it took, it took me a long time to find this, but this is actually a photostat copy where it's actually, the letters are actually big enough and you can actually read it. I've gotten these before and they've not been very good prints, but this is actually really good. Listen to the title of this book. <laughs> Conciliatory or Ironical Animadversions. Animadversions. On the controversies agitated in Britain under the unhappy names of antinomians and neonomians. Now, there's a lot of neonomians out there today uh, that are cranking out bad stuff, like Piper. And I, I, um, I've heard uh, Mark Jones identified as a neonomian. In fact, Michael Horton said he, he in his opinion, verges on that. So there, there's people like this all over the place. And I wanted to see what Witsia said because I started reading The Economy of the Covenants, and it is just outstanding standing stuff it is just outstanding now it's not a complete systematic theology but he goes into he has sections on faith justification and all like a lot of the major heads of doctrine in there um and so i'm, I'm looking forward to, to getting through it it's a little bit difficult reading because he's you know writing a long time ago but there's a chapter of this book conciliatory conciliatory or ironical animadversions by herman witsius there was a section called paradoxical assertions concerning the utility of holiness now what he means by that is he, he's going to go through a lot of the passages that talk about um that, that describe you know people that go to heaven as those who do good works um and those who um uh, did good to the resurrection of life those who who did evil to the resurrection of condemnation and things like that and he's going to to go into this and what he has to say about this is outstanding it is just outstanding so with no more ado, I want to get into this, and I, I want you to hear the clear thinking of this guy. Now, um, real quick, what, what are his dates? I, I want you to know when this guy was alive. I can't remember if it's in the front of this or not. Okay, where where are you, man? When did you live and when did you die? It's got to be in here. This The hardback will have it. Somewhere in here. Come on, where are you? Where are you? There it is. Uh, he was born on February 12, 1636. Oh, there it is. 1636 to 1708. So for someone who lived back then, he lived he lived for a while. You know, that's that's kind of unusual. What is that? Uh, my, my math is right. So he lived to be 72. That, yeah, that's unusual for that century. So 1636 to 1708. Um, fascinating individual. But Beaky makes a reference to this very difficult to find book. Um, but I'm very thankful I found copy of it. It's not on the Puritan hard drive. I have the Puritan hard drive and couldn't find it on there. Um, but somebody uh, photo uh, did a real good job photocopying the pages of probably a very, very old copy. And it's in here. Uh, it's nicely bound and it's not good. It looks like it's not going to fall apart. This is the classic reprint series. I, I have a lot of books like this. 
books that are hard to find oftentimes you can find them on amazon someone will do this with them and sometimes they're not made well and the books will fall apart but this looks actually like it's pretty sturdy so i'm definitely gonna um, mark this one up and protect it so um if anyone wants to borrow this you can't borrow it um some of my books m most of the stuff in here i'll let people borrow but if it's if it's a rare book that took me a long time to find and it's, it was hard to get uh, i usually i'm not gonna let it out <clears throat> okay or you can look at it but I, I need to be with you the whole time and you don't you don't want me to move in with you afternoon coffee you got three o'clock coffee and oh, man i don't know what I, would, what I would do without it all right with respect to the utility of holiness and good works i find the following things disputed whether it be justly said number one that good works are of no profit to us in order to the possession of salvation so that though they are acknowledged not to be the cause of reigning they cannot be reckoned even the way to the kingdom that whatever good we do, we do it not for ourselves, but for Christ. That nothing is to be done that we may live, but because we do live. Okay? Number two. That it is unlawful to do any good with the intention that by doing it we may promote our own salvation. Okay? agree. I would agree with both of those statements so far. Three. That there is no duty of virtue or holiness, however imperfectly performed, uh, however perfectly performed, whereby we can gain even the least good to ourselves, either in this life or in that which is to come, for that no evil or hurt can be avoided by so doing, neither can peace of conscience nor joy in the Holy Ghost nor assurance of the remission of sins nor consolation be promoted in this way. Four, that the exercise of holiness and good works is not to be reckoned a proper and even a sufficient evidence and argument that we are in a state of grace, and in the certain expectation of glory. Five, that even the sincere holiness of believers proceeding from the spirit of grace is in its exercise filthiness and dung before God, and that consequently he who studies holiness with all the diligence he can is not a whit more pleasing and acceptable to God than if he neglected it or indulged himself in vice. Okay, Roman numeral two. Truly, these things are so unusual in the very sound of the words and so unexpected from the mouth of a Christian, much less from his who is reputed a teacher of evangelical holiness and professes and exercises it in piety of life, that they cannot but strike horror into the hearers and fill their minds with strong prejudices against the teacher and the doctrine. But it must also be confessed that horror will be not a little diminished when we hear the learned man himself and those who are on his side explaining their mind more at large. Which indeed is very necessary to the decision of the controversy. Let us now attend to them. Okay, Roman numeral three. They teach in general that it is so far from being possible to separate holiness and good works from salvation. That they are a part of salvation purchased for us by Christ. You hear that? That you know, works and salvation, are you can't separate them, so they're a part of salvation. Our works are a part of salvation, purchased for us by Christ. For we are created in him unto good works. They add that the end ends of good works are very remarkable, namely the manifestation of our obedience and subjection, the promoting of the glory of the grace of God, in this that we endeavor to be useful to others, the edification of our neighbor, the gathering of ourselves together under Christ Jesus, who hath promised that he will be found in them, Besides, they put us in mind that in all these assertions, the only end they propose is that the glory of free justification may remain entire to God and Christ, and that no justifying virtue may be attributed to our works of whatsoever kind. Okay, Roman number four. Having premised these general observations, they explain the several assertions much in this manner. One, that there is no believer under heaven to whom it is given to ascend the celestial heights until he has in his generation served the purpose of God. None believes in Christ and receives him by faith who is not after that reception created in him two good works that he may walk in them. Meanwhile, Christ is the only way to life. The practice of godliness is the necessary labor and occupation of those who walk in this way. Further, we do no good for ourselves, since all things requisite to salvation were abundantly performed for us by Christ, who alone died for all, that they who live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but to him who died for them and rose again. 2 Corinthians 5.15 The tenor of the legal covenant is, Do this, and thou shalt live. But the doctrine of grace is, Christ hath quickened thee. Therefore do thou live in the life of the Son of God, and testify it, 
by a holy activity. Okay, Roman numeral five. Secondly, God hath blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. There is in Christ, neither is there a more certain assurance of salvation to be found elsewhere than in Christ, who finished it most perfectly for us. If therefore we seek to finish it for ourselves, what do we else but that which is already done, laboring in vain? Besides, the generous spirit of true Christianity is far from mercenary meanness. Neither does it teach us thus, I will carefully addict myself to the exercise of good works, that I may gain eternal reward. But rather in this manner, the lines have fallen unto me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all my days. And because Christ has provided so abundantly for me, hence contented with so great opulence, and seeking nothing further by my own works, I will glorify him in my body and my spirit, and serve my generation to the glory of his grace." Isn't that great? I mean, he's, he's exactly right. I'm not trying to finish. I'm not trying to complete the work. Christ already finished it. Okay, Roman numeral 6. Thirdly, our duties, even the best and most excellent, have no efficacy of themselves to do us any good. All efficacy depends upon the blessing of God and Christ. Therefore, it must be inculcated that we can ward off no evil by our prayers or any other exercises of religion, lest, as is generally the case, we attribute unto them any power to reconcile us to God, which lies in the satisfaction of Christ alone. <laughs> you hear that? Um, you cannot attribute any power, any power of any kind, to your good works done as a Christian to um, reconcile you to God or get you into heaven or, or anything like that. In fine, in fine, what do our works avail to peace of conscience and joy in Christ? Which, if we attend unto their imperfection and the pollution wherewith they are defiled, proclaim nothing but war, the, bl the blood of Christ only proclaims peace, which you seek in vain elsewhere. He is our peace. Man, that is just right, right on the money. Okay, Roman numeral 7. Fourthly, the principal evidences whereby it appears that we are in Christ are reckoned by many to be these, universal obedience, sincerity of heart, and love towards the brethren. But though these in their own kind and within their own sphere are of remarkable use to this purpose, yet because they are weakened by the flesh, they are scarcely sufficient to give solid assurance to the soul. For there is no man provided he attend to himself, but will easily find that they are all subject to so great blemishes that the soul, solicitous concerning its own salvation, has a difficulty to satisfy itself in discerning these marks. The Spirit of the Lord must first reveal his grace to our spirit and endue us with faith, whereby we may receive that testimony of the Divine Spirit, that content with it we may quiet our heart before any duty of holiness can give evidence of a matter of such importance. Hear, hear what he's saying? You've got to be relying on Christ alone first. Your heart has to rest solely in the merit of Christ before you can even start thinking about if you're bearing fruits that can bolster your assurance. He, he's right. Listen, but after the testimony of the divine spirit received by faith hath produced assurance in the soul, then the gifts of the divine spirit, together with the spirit of the Lord and the heart of the believer, bear witness. Hear what he's saying? You first rest in Christ alone. Then you'll start bearing good fruit. You don't bear fruit in order to gain that assurance first. The assurance comes from Christ alone. And then and only then will you have a right frame of mind towards good works. Isn't that a far cry from justification? It receives a finished work outside of you. Then in final salvation, you're saved by your fruits. Listen to what's this, okay? Point, Roman numeral 8. Fifthly, when Paul testifies in Philippians 3.8 that he counts all things but loss and dung for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus and that he might gain Christ, by these words he excludes as to justification before God all works, whether previous to faith or following it, as is excellently observed by Beza. That's Theodore Beza. For the elucidation of which point it is proper to make the following remarks. One, the graces, now this, is very, this is a very important section here, I remember reading this a few days ago. The graces of the sanctifying spirit flow clear and pure from their fountain. 
too. But running through the channels of our hearts, infected with corruption, from their filth, they contract uncleanness. Okay, so the graces of the sanctifying spirit in our hearts. He produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, um, self-control, etc. Th those fruits, the putting sin to death and the pursuit of holiness, holy aspirations and desires. But as they come through the channel of our hearts, they're infected with corruption from their filth and they contract uncleanness. Okay, three. And hence it is that all our best duties and exercises are polluted. Okay, I'll just break from the quotation here. That's why they can't finally save you. Everything I ever do as a Christian, no matter how closely I'm walking with God, no matter how many sins I have achieved a great measure, if not what seems like total victory over, I still am falling so far short of the glory of God that my best works being corrupted by the sinfulness of my heart could damn me to hell easily. Easily. Four. And consequently, they cannot be reckoned for our righteousness before God's tribunal. Don't you love that? What he's saying is that sanctification, everything that's part of sanctification, cannot enter in to the tribunal of God. It will not be brought forward in the forensic court as legal evidence on the day of judgment. And it cannot save you from God's wrath. And if you're trusting that the fruits of your faith are going to save you at the last day, you are lost. And you don't understand Christianity at all. Fifth. There is therefore no reason why we should glory in duties well performed, or on their account commend ourselves to God, but that rather being covered with shame, we should implore pardon. <laughs> so, the fruits of your faith, you should be asking for forgiveness for the corruption that they are still infected with. Witsius, I love this guy. He, he's, he is fast becoming one of my favorite. In fact, I've got... Everything I can find that uh, Banner of Truth or Reformation Heritage. Um, yeah, there's a two-volume work, The Apostles' Creed, where he goes to The Apostles' Creed. That's going to be a set that I, I work my way through. I've learned so much from this guy already. He's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Herman Witsius. Okay, sixth. Whatever proceeds from us. Listen to this sentence. Whatever proceeds from us, compared with the most immaculate holiness of God... And in respect of the imperfection cleaving to it, arising from a mixture of sin dwelling in us, causes that the duties performed by us, if considered in themselves, are nothing but dung. He's right. Seventhly, nevertheless, by faith in Christ, all the filthiness of our sins is washed away by him, who presents to God these duties cleansed by his blood alone, and makes them pleasing and acceptable to him which he does not, except we entirely renounce ourselves and our own righteousness and count it all but loss and dung. Ah, that is so good. Listen to that again. Nevertheless, by faith in Christ, all the filthiness of our sins is washed away by him who presents to God these duties cleansed by his blood alone and makes them pleasing and acceptable to him. Okay, our works, in a sense, are justified before God. Not to get us into heaven, but to get us rewards. Not salvation, not justification, not reconciliation with God. In fact, if you think they are doing that, you won't get any reward for your good works. Listen, God doesn't accept our works as cleansed by his blood unless we entirely renounce ourselves and our own righteousness and count it all but loss and dung. So you've got to make a separation between the fruits that you bear as a Christian and that which gets you into heaven and makes you right with God. Okay, eighth. In fine, since we ourselves and the spiritual sacrifices which we offer unto God are not acceptable to him but by Jesus Christ, it is unlawful to presume so much upon our holiness, however great, as to ask that on its account, considered in itself and separately from Christ, we may please God. Man, that is good stuff. He's right. So what he, what he in, as only the Puritans could do, in very, very well thought out, very well written sentences that are a little more flowery than, than I write or, or say, it is not until you've settled the issue, what you're going to rely on to get you into heaven 
is the blood and righteousness of Christ. Period. Before you do that, you can't look to your works to help give you assurance. It is something that's added on to a robust faith that rests only in Christ Jesus. As you see the fruits of that work, your faith remains steadfastly in Christ alone to get you past the final judgment. Because justification is a once-for-all legal verdict. It is the final assize. It is the final judgment brought back in time applied to us now. Our justification is the legal declaration that we are righteous on the day of judgment itself. Because what Christ endured at the cross was the fullness of divine wrath and what he achieved in his life that is reckoned or imputed to our account. That alone meets the requirements of God's law and God's holiness. My progress in sanctification can no more add to that or complete it or finally save me than I could jump over the moon. It absolutely is impossible. Okay, so that was uh, that chapter there. Now, real quick, I wanted to um, pull up my copy in Kindle here. Uh, in fact, I, I can point this. Uh, it is pointed there. Okay, let me, uh, let me get the uh, thing. I was, I was reading uh, Spurgeon there a little bit ago. Uh, I finished with my uh, sermons a little bit early today, so I was going to um, just doing some studying today. That's always a good thing to, to do some studying. Uh, let's see. What, see us. Where are you here? There it is. Economy of the Covenants and Kindle. And I'm going to back up to where I started highlighting stuff. Let's see. Uh, there it is. Okay. This section here where he, he describes the difference between covenant of works, covenant of grace. And it's just outstanding. It's just so useful. This guy understood covenant theology better than almost anyone I've ever read. Okay, let me take another sip of my afternoon coffee here. All right, listen to Herman Witsius. Now, let me just let's see if I can get you some context here. Was this under a heading? <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. Of the divine covenants in general. Okay, yeah, he, he does a study of, of the uh, the Hebrew term barit uh, for covenant and then diatheke, the Greek word for covenant. But then he gives this list of contrasts. Yeah, I just want to read through this and then we'll, we'll wrap up um, the program here. This is <laughs> Roman numeral 15. Um, this, the Puritans, gotta love this. Uh, when they wrote their books, when they preached their sermon. Uh, 19thly in my sermon this morning. Uh, you know, you guys think I'm, I'm rough having a three-point sermon. How would you like a 28-point sermon? Anyway, so... Point 15 of the covenants in general. Listen to this. In scripture, we find two covenants of God with man. The covenant of works, otherwise called the covenant of nature or the legal and covenant and the covenant of grace. Okay. The apostle teacheth us this distinction, Romans 3.27, where he mentions the law of works. That's the legal covenant, covenant of works, and the law of faith by the law of works. Okay, understanding that doctrine which points out the way in which by means of works salvation is obtained and by the law of faith, that doctrine which directs by faith to obtain salvation. The form of the covenant of works is that man that doeth these things shall live by them. Romans 10, 5, and there he's citing from, uh, Paul citing from Leviticus 18, 5. That of the covenant of grace is whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. Romans 10, 11. These covenants of mercy agree first that in both, the contracting parties are the same, God and man. Second, in both, the same promise of eternal life, consisting in the immediate fruition of God. Thirdly, the condition of both is the same, perfect obedience to the law. Nor would it have been worthy of God to admit man to a blessed communication with him, but in the way of unspotted holiness. Fourthly, in both the same end, the glory of the most unspotted goodness of God. But in these following particulars, they differ. So covenant of works, covenant of grace differ in these ways. One, the character or relation of God and man in the covenant of works is different from what it is in the covenant of grace. In the former, in the covenant of works, God treats as the supreme lawgiver and the chief good, rejoicing to make his innocent creature a partaker of his happiness. In the latter, as infinitely merciful, a judging life to the elect sinner consistently with his wisdom and justice. Okay. Secondly, in the covenant of works, there was no mediator. In that of grace, there is the mediator, Christ, Jesus. Thirdly, in the covenant of works, the condition of perfect obedience was required to be performed by man himself who had consented to it. In the covenant of grace, the same condition is proposed as to be or as already performed by a mediator. And in this sub substitution of the person consists the principal and essential difference of the covenants. Fourth, 
In the covenant of works, man is considered as working and the reward to be given as of debt. Okay, he's right. There is no grace in the covenant of works. Okay, God is not operating on a gracious principle with man before the fall. So listen to that again. This is point number four down here. In the covenant of works, man is considered as working and the reward to be given as of debt. In other words, Adam would have earned by pure personal merit and by his obedience the right to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay. Um, it was not through grace and it was not through faith. Okay. Man doesn't need faith. He doesn't need grace yet at all. Okay. I wrote that in my notes there. And therefore man's glorying is not excluded. Okay. Um, <laughs> Just put some names of neonomians in there. So man would be able to boast. If he if Adam had fulfilled that covenant, Adam and everyone in him would be able to say, We are in heaven because we obeyed and because we deserve to be here by our own merit, because we obeyed the covenant. Okay? But he may glory as a faithful servant may do upon the right discharge of his duty and may claim the reward promised to his working. Okay, so it is a covenant of works. I, put, I wrote, I love this man because <laughs> he's so clear about it. There's no grace yet. There's no need for that. There's no need for grace until man sins. Now he goes on. In the covenant of grace, man in himself ungodly is considered in the covenant as believing. And eternal life is considered as the merit of the mediator, that's Christ, and as given to man out of free grace, which excludes all boasting. Besides the glorying of the believing sinner in God as his merciful Savior. Man, that is so good. Fifthly, in the covenant of works, something is required of man as a condition which performed entitles him to the reward. You hear that? Adam had to obey to, have, to receive a title to the reward. It is Jesus Christ alone re received by faith alone. His obedience to the covenant of works and his taking his penal sanction of death and then rising again and conquering it, that imputed to us by faith alone, not by our works, not by sanctification, not by pursuing holiness or putting sin to death, but what Christ alone did gives us a legal title to enter heaven that can never be revoked. The covenant of grace, with respect to us, consists of the absolute promises of God in which the mediator the life to be obtained by him, the faith by which we may be made partakers of him, the benefits purchased by him, and the perseverance in that faith. In a word, the whole of salvation and all the requisites to it are absolutely promised. Man, that is great. That is so encouraging. Sixthly, the special end of the covenant of works was the manifestation of the holiness, goodness, and justice of God, uh, conspicuous in the most perfect law, most liberal promise, and in that recompense of reward to be given to those who seek him with their whole heart. The special end of the covenant of grace is Ephesians 1, 6, the praise of the glory of his grace and the revelation of his unsearchable and manifold wisdom, which divine perfections shine forth with luster in the gift of a mediator by whom the sinner is admitted to complete salvation without any dishonor to the holiness, justice, and truth of God. Man. And that's because Christ has met that holiness, justice, and truth vicariously for us we simply receive it in our empty beggar's hand faith alone there is also a demonstration of the all-sufficiency of god by which not only man but even a sinner which is more surprising may be restored to union and communion with god but all this will be more fully explained in what follows and then he, he's going to go into the contracting parties and everything else coming works goes in great detail but I thought that was a very well-articulated summary of the distinction between covenant of works, covenant of grace, and the importance of recognizing that one's a legal covenant that promised reward to obedience and righteousness and merit and faithfulness and works. Uh, the other promises life by faith in someone else who has met the requirements of the covenant of works. Okay, And that is what makes it gracious. It is, it is gracious because... We are unconditionally elected, given to Christ before the foundation of the world. And what he do does in our behalf is imputed to us freely when we are effectually called uh, and we receive the full benefits. Do you hear what, what Witsi has said there? It's almost like he anticipated some of the debates we're having today. Special end of the covenant of grace is the praise of the glory of his grace and the revelation of his unsearchable and manifold wisdom, which divine perfections shine forth with luster in the gift of a mediator. Listen by whom the sinner is admitted to complete salvation. 
without any dishonor to the holiness, justice, and truth of God. Exactly. Because it is Christ's righteousness that is considered by God on the day of judgment by which I will enter heaven and his cross is accepted as the full payment for my sins. He will see us hidden in Christ. When Christ, who is our life, appears, we will appear with him in glory. Colossians 3, 1 through 4. Okay, so just wanted to share that with you. Love, Herman Witsius. I'm going to be reading more of conciliatory and ironical animadversions. Man, those guys needed to, like, uh, they needed to take a class on how to title books to make them more popular. But this is a little jewel of a book over here. I'm going to be reading it. I'll probably share some more things uh, with you from it uh, as time goes on. But uh, thank you for watching or for listening. Have a great Lord's Day Sunday, and we'll see you all again soon.